But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short, short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Righteousness now revealed, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. So welcome, it's our, it's our joy this morning to continue in our weekly consideration of Paul's epistle to the church at Rome. Uh, and this morning, it's our joy to arrive at Romans chapter 3, verse 21, where in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, as we come to this text, we walk, as it were, out of the dark depths of our own sin and depravity and into the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, right? We walk out of the depths of darkness, the darkness of our own sin, and into the light of the gospel from the malady that plagues us and has certainly been seen to have plagued us over the last few chapters, uh, to the remedy that saves us now as Paul begins his uh, glorious exposition of the gospel. As we come to the end of Paul's scathing indictment against humanity for their sin against God, having walked through that section of Romans um, now over several months, having looked at Paul's case as he has held sinful man under the searing spotlight of God's law, we come to the end of that section of text and we're compelled to ask, ask the question, right? How can we possibly be saved? How can anyone who fits that description, how can they be saved by God? Why would God ever save anyone who is described by those texts that we've just spent months working through? Why would God ever save any of us? How can a sinful man be right with a holy God? It's the question of the ages. It's the most important question that you'll ever have to answer. Listen to me, young boys, young girls. It's a very important question for you to consider. How can you, in your sin, be right with God who is perfectly sinless? How can a sinful man be right with a holy God? Their throat is an open tomb. Right With their tongues, they've practiced deceit. Snake venom is under their lips. Their mouths full of cursing and bitterness. Hearts pouring forth cursing and bitterness. How can that unrighteous man be right with that God who is holy, righteous, and good? The issue for us this morning is one of righteousness. The issue is one of righteousness. God is righteous and you are not. God is holy and you aren't. He is, we ain't, you see. You must have you must have a perfect righteousness in order to be right with God. In order to be accepted by God, to be in fellowship with God, to be in communion with God, to be in heaven with God, you have to be perfect. Perfect. A perfect righteousness. We must have a perfect righteousness in order to be acceptable in His sight. To be embraced by Him, you must be perfect. If you have sin. If you have sin, you're rejected by God because God is sinless. How can sin men inhabit the perfection of his fellowship, inhabit the perfection of his communion, the perfection of heaven? It's impossible. It's impossible. If sinful men inhabited the perfection of heaven, heaven would no longer be heaven. Heaven would look a lot more like hell. It's because we are sinful creatures. And listen, we don't need merely forgiveness of sins. That's what the world thinks today. Many think that today. I just need to be forgiven of my sin. No, no, no. Forgiveness, forgiveness is not enough. It is not enough to be forgiven of your sin. We need 
righteousness. We need a perfect obedience. We need a complete obedience. Not merely a righteousness that is a result of avoiding all the things that we're not supposed to do, but a righteousness that includes doing all the things that we are supposed to do. Right? A perfect righteousness, a complete obedience. And Paul has so carefully, masterfully established, inarguably established, that we are unrighteous in every respect. Unrighteous in every respect. We have no righteousness of our own. In fact, the righteousnesses that we do think that we have are as filthy rags in the sight of God. And we cannot obtain it. We're incapable of obtaining a righteousness on our own or a righteousness of our own. You can't do it. If that guilty, inexcusable, wretched man of Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 is to be saved. If that man is to be saved, then where is that right? Where do we get it? How do we attain to it? Where does it come from? What is its substance? How do I stand before God righteous? How do I stand before him just? That's what it means to stand before God justified in his sight. Paul tells us in chapter 3, verse 21, after all of that, but now... But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. It's a righteousness from God apart from the law. That righteousness from God is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The verse begins with but now. But now. Luther calls them the most important words in the whole Bible. <laughs> but now. Great words. Encouraging words. Right? Glorious. Gracious merciful words, but now. These words, but now, introduce a contrast with what has gone before. That was the case, but now <laughs> this is the case. And I want you to see this contrast in two ways from the grammar of the text. First, in verse 21, there's a topical contrast being introduced by these words. And then secondly, there's a temporal contrast contrast being introduced by these words. One's topical, one's temporal. Now I'll explain what that means. First, right, Paul intends a topical contrast here with what has come before. The use of these words, but now, introduces a change of subject, if you will. Um, goes from man's deplorable unrighteousness, and now we're going to talk about God's righteousness. Change the subject. Right? Paul, a masterful prosecuting attorney, has made his case against all mankind. Humanity has been condemned by the law for their sin against God. Paul has charged all men, both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. There are none righteous, not one Jew and not one Greek, not one Gentile, not one person. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. Every one of them, all of them have turned aside. They have made themselves worthless. There is no one on the planet who does good. No, not one. You think you're a good person? No, you're not. You see? What does the law tell us? What does the law tell you? The law tells you that you're guilty. Boys and girls, what does the Ten Commandments, what do the Ten Commandments tell you? The Ten Commandments tell you that you're guilty. What does the law tell you? What does your conscience tell you? Your conscience tells you that you're guilty. The law tells us that we're guilty, worthy of death, deserving of hell. And God is righteous. And what is the tragic implication of that verdict that is handed down by the law? What's the implication of that? That we are completely, absolutely incapable of establishing for ourselves a righteousness or a holiness that is acceptable in the sight of God. We can't do it. It's impossible. We can't do it. We are incapable of making ourselves acceptable to him, incapable of being brought into a living fellowship with him, incapable of having a full communion with him by the works of the law, in other words, by good works, no flesh 
no person will be justified, found to be right, in his sight. No person will be pardoned. No person will be forgiven. No person will be acquitted. No person will be declared just. No person will be accepted by God by works of the law. The word justification is a legal term. It's a pronouncement. The word justification is a declaration of the judge in the divine court of law that one is righteous. It's a declaration that one is righteous, acceptable in the sight of God, who is altogether holy and altogether righteous. How is it for you and I, sinners, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. How is it that you and I can have that legal declaration made about us? How is it that that pronouncement could be made for me, for you? How could we be declared just? How could we be justified when we have no righteousness? No righteousness. Apart from righteousness, it's impossible. You cannot be justified apart from righteousness. The issue is righteousness. We need righteousness. The problem is we have none. We have no righteousness of our, no, of our own. In Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, Paul established on the testimony of an arguable evidence that no person can attain a saving righteousness by works of the law. No person could attain the righteousness that they need by works of the law. But now, <laughs> praise God for the but now, but now, a saving righteousness, the righteousness that you need, namely the very righteousness of God himself, is revealed. It's revealed. Where is it? How can I get it? I need it, right? It is God's righteousness, and that righteousness is provided, revealed, apart from the law. You can't work your way to it. You can't work your way to earn it, to get it, to obtain it. It certainly could be translated the righteousness of God. Many of your translations have it there as that, righteousness of God. In some cases, when they translate it that way, they mean to speak of God's own righteousness, God's own attribute of righteousness that is given as a gift of God to the sinner, his perfect righteousness that is credited or imputed to us through faith. But it would be better here to think of this as a righteousness that comes from God. You're looking at the Greek, guys. It's a genitive of source. The source of this righteousness is God. It's a gift of a God righteousness given to the believer through the instrumentality of faith. It's a gift of a God righteousness given to the believer through his faith. In other words, it's not a human righteousness per se. It's not a human righteousness. It's not a righteousness merely conceived of in relationship to law, but it is a righteousness that in all ways measures up, as it were, to all the demands of God's own perfections. It is a God righteousness. It's a righteousness, if you think about it this way, it's a righteousness that would have been far beyond what Adam would have enjoyed in the garden before the fall. His righteousness, that righteousness, would have fallen short of this righteousness. This is a God righteousness. Dr. Murray says this, nothing serves to point up the effectiveness, the completeness, the irrevocableness, you can't take it away, <laughs> the irrevocableness of this justification, the righteousness which is unto justification is a righteousness that is characterized by the perfection belonging to all that God is and all that God does. It is a God righteousness. Does that make sense? So our but now then, what is that a contrast between? It's a contrast between our unrighteousness and God's righteousness, but more than that, it is a contrast between the guttermost and the uttermost, right? The depths, the depths of a man's depravity to the heights of a God righteousness. From the guttermost to the uttermost. This is the good news. 
That's what the word gospel means. Gospel means good news. This is good news. From the dark de- depravity to the heights of a God righteousness by which we are accepted into the beloved and as he is the beloved, so am I in this world. That kind of righteousness. It's amazing, isn't it? From the guttermost to the uttermost. It's a contrast for you. In other words, there is a way, there is a way for wicked and sinful people to be right with a holy and just and righteous God. There is a way of salvation apart from the hopelessness of keeping the law. There's only one way, only one way, one way. The gracious provision of a God righteousness apart from the law. One way of salvation, one way. The gracious provision of a God righteousness apart from the works of the law through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, but now, but now introduces that topical contrast, you see. Now, second, there's a temporal contrast. There's a temporal contrast evident in those opening words, but now. Notice the element of timing in Paul's statement. The righteousness of God, verse 21, namely, that righteousness from God given through faith in Jesus Christ, that righteousness from God is now revealed meaning revealed at the present time, at the present time. Now, Paul doesn't mean by saying that, using the word now, doesn't mean that this revelation of righteousness is new. Doesn't mean that it's new. In fact, verse 21, it's the same revelation of the righteousness from God that was witnessed by the law and the prophets. Right? The same revelation of righteousness we find witnessed in the Old Testament scriptures. The point of chapter 4, if you glance over at chapter 4, The point of chapter 4 will be that the Old Testament saints were saved in the very same way. And Paul is going to go all the way back to Genesis and the example of Abraham to show us that very point, right? This is not new, this righteousness. It is very old. But it has now, Paul says, been revealed. And the way in which it has been, or the way in which it is now revealed is through the person and work of Jesus Christ through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's like, if you will, it's like reading the script to a magnificent play. Think about a masterful play, a tremendous work of art, a stunning masterpiece written centuries before. But until the curtain is raised, right, until the light dims, until the actors take their place on the stage, it has not been made manifest. It has not been yet revealed. But now, (laughs) when the lights go down, the curtain raises, and the actors take their places, but now it is going to be revealed. Do you see? Paul says, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. It's now. It's in our time that Jesus Christ has taken his place upon the stage of history. The curtain is not just raised. The curtain's been rent from top to bottom. Jesus Christ came upon the stage of history, taking the form of a slave, coming in the likeness of men, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The one has now come whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. The one whom God has set forth has come to demonstrate, to present, as it were, God's righteousness. Now, at this present time, Jesus Christ has already come. Do you see? But now. Now, at this present time, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is made manifest, is revealed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word is in the perfect tense, meaning it's completed. Perfect tense. It's completed, but it has effect even now in our present time. Effects right now. In the hearing of the gospel, the righteousness that is from God through faith is now being revealed. Do you see? Made manifest. The apex of redemptive history has come. Even now, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father, exalted above the heavens. And the law and the prophets greatly anticipated his walk across the stage. Peter describes the prophets as inquiring and searching carefully. 
Peter says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicated when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. These are things into which angels long to look. Jesus says that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and was glad. The Old Testament saints witnessed that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ through the veil of types and shadows. But now it has been revealed. It has been made manifest. And that in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That which is in the old concealed is in the new revealed. So you see in the, those words that open verse 21, but now, there is both a topical and a temporal contrast being introduced. So with those words then, but now, Paul plunges us, as it were, into his exposition of the gospel that will follow. With these words, Luther calls them the heart of the Bible. The heart of the Bible. It's the great turning point. The great turning point, but now. There's a hymn by William Matson, 19th century hymn writer, that expresses this thought beautifully. Uh, Matson writes, Lord, I was blind. I could not see in thy marred visage any grace. But now the beauty of thy face in radiant vision dawns on me. Lord, I was deaf. I could not hear the thrilling music of thy voice. But now I hear thee and rejoice in all thine uttered words are dear. Lord, I was dumb. I could not speak the grace and glory of thy name. But now, as touched with living flame, my lips thine eager praises wake. Lord, I was dead. I could not stir my lifeless soul to come to thee. But now, since thou hast quickened me, I rise from sin's dark sepulcher. All right, but now. Beautiful words, right? But now. There's, there's volumes of theology contained in those two words. Do you see? Volumes of truth. This is how, this is how faith in Jesus Christ answers the condemnation of the law. But now, right? But now, you're a sinner. You don't deserve forgiveness. You don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve Christ. That's absolutely true. That is absolutely true. But now, look at what you've done, right? Look at what you've done. Look at what you continue to do. That's true. But now, right? But now, when you are weeping with your face and your hands over the, all the ways that you've sinned in the past, over all the ways that you continue to sin against him, you need to remind yourself of those words. That is an expression of of faith in the truths of the gospel. That's true, God, but now. Right? That's true, but now. But now, when you're weighed down by doubts, when you're crushed over your remaining corruption, accused under the law, you answer with faith in Jesus Christ for the gospel. But now, those things are true. But now, because of him, not because of me, but because of him. When Satan tempts me to despair, tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. But now, right, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. If you've turned from your sin to put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you live in the reality of but now. Right, but now. And those things that the accuser might say of you, although they be true, we have a Savior who has overcome our sin, who has freed us from sin, who has paid our penalty, who has done away with our guilt, who has bore our shame on himself, on the tree. He took my place. He stood in my place and bore the punishment that I deserve that I might be set free. And set free through his person and work in those glorious words. Right, But now. Those are gospel words. You see, gospel words. Faith-filled words. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. With those words, Paul introduces the subject of the text before us. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. A righteousness that is now revealed. A plan for us to consider this text under three headings over the next couple of weeks. One, Righteousness now revealed, we'll see that in verse 21 today. 
to righteousness now given, verses 22 to 24, and righteousness now demonstrated, verses 25 and 26. We're going to unpack this text and look at those three headings, righteousness now revealed, righteousness now given, and righteousness now demonstrated. First, with me this morning, consider righteousness now revealed, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God, or better, that righteousness which is from God, is revealed. Now, when you read that, verse 21, you should hear echoes, don't you? Hear echoes. Uh, This statement of Paul hearkens back, if you will. It echoes, connects us to what has gone before. In fact, much of this passage, verses 21 to 26, reminds us of the grand statement of Paul's theme all the way back in chapter 1, verse 16. Turn there, just flip the page. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says there, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Why? It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, also for the Greek. Verse 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God, or that righteousness from God, is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just person shall live by his faith. Now what we, what we won't notice there in these words, without going to the original language, is that Paul, now in Romans chapter 3, enhances our understanding of that word revealed. He uses that word revealed there in the statement of his theme, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, later again, and then now in chapter 3. Paul's original term in chapter 1, verse 17, is the Greek word apocalypto, right, where we get apocalypse from, or the revelation of John, book of Revelation is apocalypsis. That which has been hidden is apocalypto, it is disclosed. That which is covered is unveiled. In our parlance, it's revealed, right? It's revealed, it's a revelation. In the preaching of the gospel, this righteousness of God is disclosed, right? Now flip the page, back to Romans chapter three. In chapter three, verse 21, however, the word used here for revealed is the word phanerao, It's a stronger term, phanerao. The righteousness of God is not simply revealed, but made manifest. Made manifest. More than merely making something intellectually known, more than merely disclosing to our understanding or disclosing it to our our comprehension, this is something that is displayed, something that is brought to bear, something that is applied Paul is referring referring here by using this word to something operative, something effectual, something practical, living, working. It's dynamic. It's not static. So in other words, in the preaching of the gospel, the righteousness, that righteousness which is from God is actively, operatively, effectually brought to bear upon depraved, sinful, wicked men in their fallen and hopeless condition. In that sense, it is revealed. It is made manifest. To what end then? If it is operative, it is, if it is active, if it's working, if it's effectual, to what end? To what purpose? In what way is it operative or effective? In what way would Paul say it's powerful, right? In chapter 1 verse 17, it is the power of God to salvation. So in chapter 3 verse 21, in what way is it powerful then? This righteousness is a saving righteousness. It is made manifest or revealed with saving effect. That's why Paul refers to the gospel in chapter 1 verse 16 as the power of God to salvation. What makes the gospel powerful? What is in the gospel? What is in it that gives it the power to save? Why is it active, operative, effectual, working in the life of sinners? Because in the gospel is this saving righteousness, which is from God. Do you see? This saving righteousness from God. It is the power of God to salvation. Freely given, freely offered, freely revealed, freely made manifest 
by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? This is the righteousness that sinners need. This is the righteousness that you and I need to be saved. You're not going to be righteous yourself by your works. And you need to be righteous in order to be justified right in the sight of God. This is the righteousness that you need. This righteousness. It's this righteousness that answers our question. How can sinful men be right with a holy God? And Paul then speaks of this righteousness in terms of its source and its certainty. I want you to see that with me. With reference to its source, look at verse 21. The righteousness, this righteousness is from God and it is revealed apart from the law. Right? With reference to its source, stated negatively, this righteousness is revealed apart from the law. Literally there, no the, no, it's not articular. Literally, it means apart from law. It's revealed apart from law, without respect, without any respect to human law keeping, without any respect to law whatsoever, apart from the sinner's obedience to any moral or legal moral standard, whether you're one of those Gentiles back in chapter 2, verse 14, who were a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written on their heart, right? Their conscience accusing or else excusing them, or whether you're one of those self-righteous religious people, like that self-righteous hypocritical Jewish formalist in chapter 2, verse 17, who rested in the law, made his boast in the law, was educated out of the law, put all his confidence in the law. In other words, this righteousness has no human source, no human origin. All men are born under the curse of the law. There is none righteous, no, not one. It has no human origin. It doesn't come from man. This righteousness has nothing to do with him at all. Nothing to do with you at all. It has nothing to do with anything done by you, anything wrought in you. It is something that has been done for you. <laughs> it is something that has been done for you. And it's freely offered to you. Freely offered to you. Stated negatively, this is a righteousness which is apart from law. Okay? Stated positively, this righteousness is from God. Again, not of human origin, but of divine origin. A righteousness of which God himself is the source. A righteousness of which God is the author. A righteousness which comes from him. He is the one who authors this righteousness. And he is the one who offers it then as a gift of his grace through faith. This gift of God's righteousness stands in stark contrast then, doesn't it? To that righteousness which supposedly comes through, comes through works of the law. These two are contrasted. The righteousness that is supposedly from the law and the righteousness which is from God through faith. One saves, the other damns. Do you see? There's a stark contrast. Paul speaks of a righteousness that is revealed apart from law. It is a righteousness that comes from God and is given by God through faith. It has as its source God. Flip the page to the right. Turn to Romans chapter 9. Let's look at this contrast in a couple of biblical texts. This is a righteousness that is from God and apart from law. Romans chapter 9. Drop down to verse 30. Verse 30. Let's look at this contrast together. Verse 30, what shall we say then? What shall we say? That, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? That righteousness of faith is speaking of the righteousness that is from God that is given through the means of faith, right? Paul refers to it here as the righteousness of faith. Gentiles who weren't pursuing righteousness, have attained to this righteousness, even the righteousness that is God's righteousness from God through faith. But Israel, verse 31, pursuing the law of righteousness, in other words, pursuing their right standing through works of the law, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? 
Now you could say on one part, on one part, it's because it's impossible to attain to that righteousness. You cannot attain to that righteousness by your good works. It's impossible. Why? Because you're a sinner. <laughs> you're always sinning. You're always going to sin. This side of eternity, you have your flesh to contend with. You're a sinner. You're not going to attain to any kind of righteousness by works of the law. But here, the reason that Paul gives, verse 32, is because they did not seek the righteousness, that righteousness, by faith. Instead, as it were, they sought it by works of the law. In that way, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Verse 33, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Chapter 10, verse 1, brethren, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They have missed this point that we're talking about this morning. Right? For they, being ignorant of that righteousness which is from God, being ignorant of that, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, that righteousness which they think they get through the law, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, to that righteousness which comes from God. Because, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The righteousness of God is a righteousness that becomes ours not by keeping the law, not through our obedience to the law, not through our gritting our teeth, bearing it, trying to be good people. We're not going to get there that way. It is a righteousness from God that is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. It is a righteousness that is given to us as a gift through faith. It's a righteousness from God that is revealed apart from law. Do you see? Flip to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul's going to discuss the very same thing, going to make the same point. Look there at verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul has just recounted, if you will, all of those things pre-conversion that he valued. All of those things that... Paul thought led to a right standing with God. And what does Paul say about them in verse 7? What things were gained to me, all those things that I think I benefit, that I used to think I benefited by, these, Paul says, I have counted loss for Christ. Verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him, verse 9, not having my own righteousness, which is from law, but having that righteousness, which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And what is the end of that righteousness which is from God by faith? Verse 10, that I may know him. That I may know the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection or the righteousness that Paul is seeking for is that righteousness which has its source in God. And the only way to attain to that righteousness, to, to apprehend that righteousness which is from God, that has its source in God, is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It can't be done through your works. With reference to source, this is a righteousness which is from God apart from law. Back in Romans chapter 3, with reference to its certainty then, Paul says that it is a revelation of righteousness that is witnessed by the law and the prophets. Witnessed by the law and the prophets. This provision of a righteousness from God is not plan B. Okay? Things really didn't work out too well under Moses. 
We need a reset button. It's going to be a (laughs) do-over. That was a disaster because you people are so sinful. We're going to have to come up with something else. No, that's not how this works, right? It's not how this works. It was not a plan B. The law was never meant to save anyone. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, I think it's verse 26, that the scriptures foreseeing that God would save the Gentiles through faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, right? This is not plan B. This is plan A all the way. There is no other plan. (laughs) This one doesn't fail. This is the awesome plan, right? This is the one that God intended from before the foundation of the world. The gospel was God's plan from the beginning. It's because the gospel was God's plan from the very beginning that it could be testified then to by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets testify, they witness to this gospel because it's always been there. It's always been true. It's always been right. It's always been the way that God has saved sinners. The law and the prophets testifying of its certainty. In other words, this absolutely will and has come to pass and will continue to come to pass. Why? Because this is something that God, who cannot lie, set in place, established by decree before the foundation of the world. The law and the prophets is another way of referring to the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures, right? The Old Testament scriptures. In particular, the law is often referred, uh, used to refer to the first five books of the Old Testament, right? The first, the Pentateuch. This revelation of righteousness with respect to the law This revelation of righteousness was referenced in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Referenced all the way back at the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, after the fall. The proto-euangelion, the first report of the gospel, so to speak. Proto-euangelion, where the promised seed of the woman would, through his work, crush the head of the serpent. It was witnessed through the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis, And the covenant that God made with him, that through him, through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. You could see it, couldn't couldn't you, in the types and shadows as Abraham is walking Isaac up the mountain. As Abraham is preparing the altar to deliver up his son, his only son to death, in obedience to God's command. You could see it in those types and shadows. That righteousness, which is... From God, a gift of God through faith was pointed to, pictured in all of the sacrifices and the ceremonial worship of Israel in the temple. All of that, a foreshadowing of the coming person and work of the righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ. From the law to the prophets. Listen to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Why the virgin birth? The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't inherit a sin nature from his father, Adam. He is born of the virgin. That's why the virgin birth is a necessary salvific doctrine. Behold the virgin. This is in Isaiah. 700 years before Christ came. 700 years before Christ came, Isaiah is writing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. Curds and honey shall, he shall eat, so that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good, that he may be righteous. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are the terms, the names of this one who is coming, right? Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and righteousness. From that time forward... Even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah, we're just one book right now, right? Isaiah 11, verse 3. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. 
He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Awesome. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Testified to by the law, by the prophets, centuries before his coming. Paul says it this way, verse 21, but now, (laughs) but now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. In the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So what is it exactly? Right, what is it? What is the substance of it, this righteousness from God? How is Jesus Christ involved? What is the righteousness which is from God? What is it that is revealed in the gospel apart from law? Our confession of faith explains it this way. London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 11, article 1. Those whom God effectually calls, God also freely justifies. Now, in order to be justified, you need what? Righteousness. Now, if you didn't answer that way, we're going to start all over again, right? <laughs> what do you need to be justified? You need righteousness, okay? Yeah, now you're really going to answer. You don't want to start all over again. Uh, Those whom God effectually calls, he also freely justifies. Now, he justifies them not out of thin air. He justifies them on the basis of righteousness. We have no righteousness. Where are we going to get it, right? He also freely justifies not by infusing righteousness into them so that they could be justified on the basis of their own righteousness, right? Not by causing them Like I'm going to, like a puppet, Matt, I'm going to make you obey. And then all the ways in which you obey, establish your own righteousness. And on the basis of your own righteousness, I'm going to justify you. Not how he does it. He doesn't do it by infusing righteousness into them, but by, one, pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, right? Now think with me. God freely justifies us in his own sight, declares us to be righteous in his sight, accepted, justified. He accepts us as righteous on the basis of two elements necessary to our justification. One, pardon. He forgives us of our sins. That's not done on thin air, in thin air either. How does he forgive us of our sins? Based upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. He forgives. He's not just, it doesn't just sweep sin under the rugs. I forgive you. No. It's based upon the work of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of our sins. But forgiveness of sins is not enough. It's not enough. Two, by accounting and accepting them as righteous. By accounting and accepting them as righteous. Now this accounting and accepting them as, as righteous is... Our confession continues, not for anything wrought in them and not for anything done by them, but for Christ's sake alone. In other words, it is something done entirely by Jesus Christ. And it's for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ alone that you can be accounted to and accepted as righteous, okay? Not by imputing or granting, infusing faith itself, the act of believing. You have to believe, but even that belief is a gift 
gift of God, right? or any other evangelical obedience to them, not imputing some obedience to them as their own righteousness, but, listen to our confession, by imputing, by accounting, crediting Christ's active obedience under the whole law, and by imputing Christ's passive obedience in his death for their whole and sole righteousness by faith which faith they have not of themselves, that faith is the gift of God. In other words, in your justification, in your right standing with God, you can never, ever, ever say that it is anything at all to do with anything in you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you. You are not righteous. So that their whole and their soul righteousness is his righteousness that is given to us as a gift. It has nothing to do with you. You have, on that basis, no basis on which to boast, right? Well, I believed in Jesus Christ. Did you, right? Is that a good decision or a bad decision? It's a good decision. Would you say then that that's a righteous decision? Yes. Then how is it that it's not a work of righteousness about which you can now boast? You made that good decision, right? You can boast about that. No, this righteousness is given by faith. Even the faith is a gift of God. It is the gift of God. So what, what exactly is that righteousness that we receive as a gift of God through faith? What exactly is it? What is it that is given to us apart from law, apart from any righteousness of our own? It is the very righteousness of the God-man himself. It is the righteousness of of Jesus Christ, the Lord's righteousness is our righteousness. Do you see? His active obedience, in the words of our confession, in other words, his lifetime of perfect obedience to the law of God, doing everything that the law requires, heart, soul, mind, and strength, that perfect righteousness, perfect obedience of the God-man is my righteousness now through faith in Jesus Christ. It's Heart, soul, mind, and strength, my obedience. As if I had obeyed, his righteousness is my righteousness. It refers to his passive obedience. In other words, his lifetime of suffering, up to and including all that he suffered in our place on the tree, that lifetime of walking the mud of our existence, the dirt of these, this earth, so to speak, making himself of no reputation, bearing our shame, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, enduring all that, suffering all that, is Christ's passive obedience. He was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He was willing to endure even that to save his own, right? His passive obedience. That passive obedience is credited to me as my righteousness. His active obedience, his Passive obedience. He is the one whom God set forth, we'll look at this next week, as a propitiation, right? a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. And that righteousness, anything that, <laughs> anything that I would even think about contributing to that is blasphemous, is an absurdity. Why would you couldn't contribute anything? It is an absurd thought, right? The perfect righteousness of the God-man. I can't even think of a good analogy. It'd be like, give me the rotted out, rusted out, 56 Beetle, instead of the supercar, <laughs> you know, the $3 million Bugatti, whatever those things are, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I don't want the rusted out Beetle. <laughs> His righteousness, none of my own, all of him. That's the righteousness we get. His active and his passive obedience. John Murray, God cannot but accept into his favor those who are invested with the righteousness of his own son. While his wrath is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, 
His good pleasure is also revealed from heaven upon the righteousness of his well-beloved and only begotten Son. In what way does God accept the Son? In every way. Completely, fully, with absolutely no, with great delight and with great pleasure. Then for you and I, who are in him, united to him through faith, how then does he, does he accept us? On the same basis. Delighting in us. Why? Because we're in the Son. He delights in the Son. As he is, so am I in this world. It's a glorious truth. Right? It's on this basis that God justifies the ungodly by faith. It is given to us as a gift through what our confession calls accounting. The word is imputation, meaning that God moves it from his ledger to our ledger. Jesus Christ, full righteousness, perfect righteousness in his ledger, ours bankrupt. And God, as a gift, as a free gift through faith, moves, transfers all of his righteousness to our account. (laughs) Right now, I want you to go on your phone. You got your little devices. I want you to, we want to illustrate this example. Just go on your phone and I want you to transfer out of your account 20 bucks into my account, right? And that's going to, what that's, (laughs) you see what that word means. You don't deserve that. There's nothing that you're going to do to contribute to it. It is a full, you, you have an immeasurably full account. When that is credited to you, accounted to you, it's done by accounting, by imputation. Imputation goes both ways, by the way. God also imputes or transfers the ugliness that exists in our account, transfers that out of our ledger onto his ledger, and he bears our sin and shame upon the cross. God doesn't simply disregard the sins of the ungodly. He imputes our sin to Jesus Christ who pays the penalty of our sin in full on the cross and he takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and credits it to us through faith. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. And so, and so, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. It's a righteousness now at the present time revealed. It's a righteousness from God. It's a righteousness apart from law. It's a righteousness that is witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's a righteousness... It is the very righteousness of the crucified Savior, and it's ours through faith in Him, to all and on all who believe, so that wicked sinners, you and I, might be justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. (laughs) Oh, that we would be found in Him, right, with the Apostle Paul that we would be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but having that righteousness, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, so that we may know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Considering this gift from God, won't you turn from your sin? Turn from living life for yourself. Why would you continue in that hopeless condition one second longer? Turn from sin. Abandon yourself. Entrust yourself to him. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God says, God promises that through faith, the righteousness, the very righteousness of the God-man himself, Jesus Christ, can be yours and that's the righteousness you need to stand before God. That's the righteousness you need to be, to be accepted in his sight, to be in heaven when you die. Turn from your sin and trust in him. All praise, honor, and glory be to Christ who is our righteousness. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, uh, what 
an unspeakable gift of love, Lord, uh, that you would uh, deliver up your own son in death, that he might take upon himself our sin, our shame, our punishment, our penalty, bearing that on the cross in our place, the undiluted wrath and fury of Almighty God poured out upon him, and that in grace and in mercy, you would, for wretched, undeserving, wicked sinners like us, that you would, in grace and in mercy, account to us the very righteousness of Jesus Christ himself, so that in him we might be righteous, that in him we might be accepted. In him, we might have communion with you. In him, we might be in heaven when we die. In him, we might praise you and worship you into eternity, unfettered by sin. In him, adopted as sons of the kingdom, heirs with Christ. We are in awe of the status to which we have been elevated in him. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that it has absolutely nothing to do with us. Uh, Certainly, we would foul it with our sin, our remaining corruption. And we praise you and thank you for the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, that you have, um, through faith, um, made us to inherit um, with the saints, partakers of the divine glory, inherit eternity, eternal life. Grateful for this gift, Lord. I pray there wouldn't be anyone, anyone here who would turn in light of such a glorious gift, in light of such glorious grace and mercy, kindness and compassion. There wouldn't be anyone here who would turn to reject such a glorious free offer that they would, for the sake of the bridegroom, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, they would turn from their sin, embrace the Savior in faith, and that you would, uh, in great grace and mercy to them, justify them in your sight for his sake. And it's for his sake that we pray all these things. Amen.